welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi, in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm flying solo today with uh, Philip Starker, who is an aviation historian who specialises in the Battle of Britain period, the human experience, and has written uh, coming up to about 60 books now, including Barda's Big Wing, uh, Johnny Johnson 1942 Diary, and Letters from the Few. And he's here to talk to us about his book, Spitfire Down. Uh, Dilip, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi. Let's start at the beginning and talk about the Spitfire. I don't think anyone in this country has, unless they've lived in a hole, has not heard of the Spitfire. But why does the Spitfire have such an impact in the Battle of Britain? How has it become such an icon? Well, the impact was throughout the whole war and beyond. Uh, and, in, and in fact, possibly, I, I did a programme for Channel 5 a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. uh, touching on the Spitfire. And the people there, they, they, they'd not even heard of the Schneider Trophy. Mm. So you can't talk about the Spitfire without understanding the the lineage of the aircraft. Now, you know, between the wars, uh, Jacques Schneider, the famous uh, French uh, munitions man, came up with this idea that because the 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 earth is covered by so much water, seaplanes were the way, were the future. He was wrong about that. Yes. Um, uh, and and came up with this competition where nations competed over a fixed distance for for a speed record so it was a fantastic thing because at a time when you've got the depression you've got serious unemployment you've got all of these things going on and yet concurrently with that you have a rise of nationalism and this schneider trophy contest became a, a matter of massive national competitiveness and pride uh, and of course, ultimately, Supermarine and R.J. Mitchell uh, won the coveted trophy three times and got to keep it for Britain. Uh, and the experience in making those bullet-like, record-breaking, all-metal seaplanes is what then led to the Spitfire. So the point is that you've got this fantastic competition that's captured the imagination of people all over Europe, you know, well, all over the world. I mean, the Americans, everybody, you know, and Britain wins this. Now, now, concurrently with that, we've got the arrival on the scene of the monoplane warplane, the Messerschmitt 109, a fantastic airplane, and we've got the Spanish Civil War. Now, in the Spanish Civil War, we have Guernica, the, the, you know, like you say, unless you've lived, lived with your head in a bucket, you must surely have heard Guernica, even Absolutely. if only Picasso's painting. But, but the, you know, this is the point. So, so concurrently with, with, with the Schneider Trophy, we've got this dreadful fear of bombing and air power, which is demonstrated horrifically at Guernica against civilian populations. And lots of different air theories, Douay, Balbo, all this yeah. sort of thing about the fact that an air force could win uh, a war without the army ever having to even fight a battle and, and that this could be won by bombing of the civilian population. So when Mitchell then went on to design the Spitfire, it was a winner right from the outset because it came straight off the back of the Schneider Trophy. Now, the hurricane, the Hawker hurricane d- designed by Sidney Cam, came off the drawing board earlier and was in production earlier hence yeah. why there were more hurricanes in the battle of britain than spitfires but the, the the other it's often said that the spitfire was such an advanced design that it was much more difficult to produce than the hurricane which is true to a degree but not that true the reason there were so few spitfires in the early part of the war was because supermarine was only a comparatively small factory which is suddenly absolutely overwhelmed by these massive government contracts for thousands of airplanes you know, so it didn't really take off in terms of numbers until the Castle Bromwich Aircraft Factory in Birmingham came into being, which applied the mass 
production techniques of the automotive industry to produce in Spitfire. So, so this is the thing. And then R.J. Mitchell dies, age 42, prematurely of cancer before the war. So he doesn't even get to appreciate the massive contribution he's made by making this aircraft. Uh, and it, 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 this is absolutely incredible. You know, we, we've got this fear of bombing. We've got the Schneider Trophy. We've got Mitchell's death, you know, which is all very tragic. Uh, and then we've got this beautiful aeroplane, which it is. You know, yeah. the Hurricane was very much a Hawker Fury without the top wing. The Spitfire was completely new. You know, and if you if you compare the Spitfire Mark One to the Messerschmitt 109E, the it, the, the Messerschmitt is, is the better aeroplane, especially above twenty five thousand feet, maybe. But but it, it's it doesn't look right. It's very angular. It's ugly. The Spitfire is curvaceous. It's just perfect. If you look at a Spitfire today, I don't, I don't think you'd have any idea that it was designed getting on for 100 years ago. You, you would think, you know, that it's a modern thing. And when I look through the countless photographs, wartime photographs in my archive, the thing that really dates it are the vehicles that are in the photos with yeah. it. You know, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. So the Spitfire... You know, it, in some, I mean, the, the Hurricane was was rugged. It was available in numbers for the Battle of Britain. It was excellent at media, low and medium altitude. It can outturn the 109. But the Spitfire had the high altitude capacity that the Hurricane didn't have. And these German fighters, they, they had the advantage of being able to climb to height over the Pas de Calais and Cherbourg and over the Channel. And they were coming in just under the stratosphere. They were m incredibly high up. And the ME-109 was an excellent aeroplane above 25,000 feet. And that's where the Spitfire really made the difference, because the Spitfire then provided a high-altitude umbrella able to take on these German fighters in a way that the Hurricane couldn't. And therefore, the Hurricane was enabled to get on with its business lower down against the enemy bombers. And at the end of the day, destroying enemy bombers is really what it was all about. So... The problem you've then got is we're into an arms race with the ME-109 is being constantly improved, going through the Emil, the France, and so on. Uh, and uh, the Spitfire has to keep pace with that. The Spitfire, which Joe Smith at Supermarine took over the design of and saw the Spitfire uh, uh, progress through 24 different marks and even an engine change, ultimately. You know, so Joe Smith deserves massive credit for that. Now, everybody tends to think about Mitchell, but, you know, let, let's just, just think about Joe Smith for a minute and the contribution he made. But the Hurricane wasn't able to be developed in the same way that the Spitfire was. So by the spring of 1941, the Hurricane's being phased out as a frontline day fighter, and it's been sent overseas. It did great work in the yeah. Western Desert, in Malta, and so on and so forth, you know. Um, but the Spitfire is the frontline day fighter because of this high altitude capacity fantastic airplane and that's why and then we go on you know that the spitfire fought on in every theater of war on every front it did uh jobs that it was not in you know that rj mitchell would never have imagined uh you know it was designed as a short range interceptor to defend this country in its hour of need which which mitchell recognized was coming and yet you've got the Spitfire, it's flying high altitude, unarmed photographic reconnaissance flights over deep into enemy territory. And the photographic development unit and photographic reconnaissance units, it later became, they had a great motto, unarmed and unafraid. You know, incredible stuff. It was used as a fighter bomber. It landed on aircraft carriers, became the sea fire. It fought, you know, in the Far East. It escorted bombers it had auxiliary fuel tanks to extend its range you know absolutely amazing what an airplane i don't think there can be any other aircraft in the history of, of aviation that has been developed to the extent that the spitfire has unbelievable i did my undergraduate dissertation on the luftwaffe so taking the 109 the 109 kind of pinnacles around the friedrich and when you get into the gustav and the later models it's starting to she's She's getting uglier and heavier and slower and not able to compete. But the Spitfire goes on for 22, 22 marks 24. and 24. Yeah. And post-war, she's um, they're still flying them. But the, the 109 by 1945, who's our main competitor, is just too, too tired of design by that point. That's right. 
But uh, before I, <laughs> I could go on about 109s, it's uh, it was sort of, sort of 1939 to 19, beginning of 1940. And then during the Battle of Britain, you have uh, a lot of training in this country because later in the war, they start training pilots over in Canada. But it's a bit dicey at the beginning of the war. So they, they are training a lot of flights over over England. What kind of training did they have and how dangerous was it for the pilots during that time? Well, I'd say it was very dangerous. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the training is a story all of its own, because before the war, um, pilots, you know, you would do elementary flying training and then go on to service flying training and advanced service flying training, you know, flying twin engined aircraft and mm. uh, and so on. And then you would be posted to a fighter squadron and it will be on. And we, you know, I'm just specifically talking about fighter pilots. So yeah. you, you will be posted to a fighter squadron and you you would receive your conversion to the aircraft you were going to fly operationally on the squadron. So that all worked fine until the war broke out, and particularly the Battle of France, when uh, we need, you know, we need replacement pilots. So yeah. it, it was a big dilemma then, because what th- there was an argument that there should be operational training units that provided this conversion and practice in dogfighting, high-altitude battle climbs, and all this sort of stuff. Um, Air Chief Marshal Dowding, on the other hand, didn't necessarily agree uh, immediately because he saw this as a waste of of aircraft that he needed so badly. But in the end, you know, the operational training units happened, uh, six OTU up at Harden and five OTU at Aston down near Stroud, um, and six, uh, the, the other one down at St. Athen, which, which was mainly hurricanes. Um, and, and these pilots then were flying all, all kinds of sorties. They, they'd start off in a Harvard and be checked out in a Harvard, which was a dual aircraft yeah. by their instructor. And then they would progress to fly the Spitfire. Uh, and, you know, cross country, map reading exercises, battle climbs, dogfight practice. The, the, the perhaps surprising thing is that because in the period sort of after Dunkirk and immediately before and during the early part of the Battle of Britain, there was very little opportunity for air-to-air firing because because of the shortage of ammunition. So I remember Air Vice Marshal David Scott Malden uh, telling me that when he was at Aston Down, which was in June 1940, you know, they were literally allowed just about half a second of ammunition to go and blat it into the Seven Estuary down by the seven bridge and that was your lot you know so amazing uh, but but the training you know let, let, let's be fair i mean you know i'm sure most of us aviation types would have watched top gun maverick by now i mean i've seen it about four times over you know and you look at all the gizmos and everything that's going on with the computers i mean it's just incredible and then you've got the spitfire which is comparatively it's what a morris minor is to my bmw whatever it is on the drive you know yeah. And and it's an unpressurized cockpit. You've got no head up display. All you've got is that blind flying panel and those instruments in front of you, which is a little more complicated than a car, really. Yeah. You know, uh, and you've got to navigate your way. Uh, and you've got no you've got no navigational aids. You've got no lights at night. And a Spitfire is not. A, it was never designed to be a night fighter, but it, no. it, it had to operate at night because of the shortage of dedicated night fighter aircraft. So the Hurricane was a better aircraft at night because it had a wider track undercarriage. The Spitfire was tricky to land at night and the, the great long nose as well in front of you when you're taxiing and coming down to land, you know, made, made things very difficult. So, you know, it, 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 the, the wartime landscape was a blackout. And, and I, I've, I've flown some years ago now in a 47 Squadron Hercules on a low level from Lynham all up through Snowdonia and the Black Mountains, and it was absolutely incredible. But we were wearing night vision goggles. So, you know, unless you switch your goggles off when you're in Snowdonia where there's not a lot of light, you know, you, you've got no perception of what it must have been like um, for, for the pilots during the war. And the aircraft that were on training units, generally speaking, they well, they weren't frontline aircraft. They were obsolete they were the ones that had been replaced the spit ones that were being replaced by the spit twos on the front line squadrons they were tired they were worn for example um i'm i, I did a dig on a, a spitfire that crashed in gloucestershire not far from where i live in 93 uh which was on a battle climb from aston down pilot had clearly blacked out from oxygen failure gone in from twenty thousand feet we didn't find very much just fragments 
But that aircraft during the Battle of Britain had been flown by my great friends, uh, George Unwin and mm. Jock Cunningham from 19 Squadron, both of whom shot, shot down 109s in it. And ultimately, uh, George was shot up attacking a Dornier over Brentwood and had to force land in it. And when Jock was flying it in one combat, he got a bullet through the main spar. So, um, you know, we'd always understood that that Spitfire broke up in midair, um, mm. which which may be the case because we I've got I've got a recovery license on it again at the moment, and we're going to to do a dig on it. But but with the metal detecting sweep so far, there's not a lot being found. But it, it's a typical story, you know. Th- these are primitive aircraft. That pilot crashed, Davis, Canadian, young Canadian. 20 years old, Sergeant Alvin Davis, uh, because the Austin system failed at yeah. 20,000 feet. You know, I mean, some pilots were lucky enough to regain consciousness and pull out. Others weren't. So, and the high ground as well. You know, you look at the high ground in this country, it's littered with wrecks. And it in Spitfire Down, there, there's the story of the two Spitfires there that crashed on Penny Fan Mountain, which is the highest peak south of Cadder Idris. You know, and both of those aircraft, just wandered into the mountain in clown. It's yeah. absolutely incredibly dangerous, seriously. You know, you wouldn't get me up in one. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. I had that when I was doing, uh, when I was researching my bombers, the Blenheim pilots just mm. flying into mountains. And um, they, I know it's a little bit off track, but the, uh, they did a raid with Whitley bombers that flew from Jersey to Turin and they flew through the Alps. And the mountains were higher than the ceiling of the Whitley. So there are all these guys sat in the dark watching mountains whip wow. past their aircraft. It's just absolutely crazy. Yeah, crazy indeed. But yeah, and the navigation, as you said, navigation is you literally just have a map set in your lap that you can sort of glance at and then try and figure out where you are. But, but um, we've mentioned them already. You said everyone thinks uh, Spitfire fighter aircraft, but um, they're also, they also carry out other duties. And we've mentioned this already, but um, who are the PRU? Yeah, so that's the Photographic Reconnaissance Unit. Started off as the photographic development unit at Heston and later moved to Benson. And, you know, uh, as we said, I mean, th- these people, they're, they're flying very high, very fast. Uh, well, not always very high and very fast, sometimes very low taking photographs mm. and coming back with essential intelligence on enemy shipping movements, uh, troop movements, you know, all, all kinds of things, essential I- information. Uh, and they did an amazing job, unarmed and unafraid. And, Spitfire Down tells the story of uh, 25-year-old Peter Rose from uh, Burton-on-Trent, grammar school boy, joined the Volunteer Reserve. And uh, in May 1941, he he was previously on 65 Squadron. He joined just after the Battle of Britain. Uh, And he was basically bored doing convoy patrols up and down the East Coast. They'd been on a tour to Tangmere, but it was during the winter. There wasn't a lot happening. So he transferred to to, to the PRU. Uh, and I think on about his second or third sortie, when he was off to photograph the Ruhr, he had engine failure over Belgium, bailed out, parachute didn't open. So sadly, he was killed. Nasty. But it, it's a heck of a story, that is, because he, I to get it right now, because it's, it, it, it's sometimes since I wrote the book, actually, they, they tend to come out about a year after you've written them, you know. Yeah. He, um, yeah, he, he, the Germans uh, forbade his burial in the cemetery and the local churchyard said he had to be buried at the crash site. So there was a funeral at which um, hundreds of students from Liège University turned up wearing the Belgian national colours. Mm. And the Germans went absolutely spare and broke up the gathering. And that night, uh, the village policemen uh, and others exhumed the body and secretly uh, interred Peter in in a in the Spronk family vault uh, in Sumage Cemetery, and wow. there he stayed until after the war. Now, as you know, I'm sure after the war that we we've got the Graves Registration Units operating, uh, and they're 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 concentrating casualties in one of now these wonderful Commonwealth War Graves uh, cemeteries. Mm-hmm. Um, but and that was the intention. But the villagers uh, weren't happy about this. They wanted Peter Rose to stay there. The family went out there. They wanted him to stay there. And ultimately, he did. And his 
the grave is still there now. The only proviso was that he had to be moved out of the vault and buried in an individual grave. Yeah. So, so that 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 came to pass. But if you go to Samaj today, you'll still find fresh flowers on his grave. It's it's deeply moving. But that's just one story. I mean, they they did a fantastic job. These people, unsung heroes for sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, going back to the naval history, the PRU Spitfire that spotted Bismarck and Prince Eugen. That's right. Absolutely. I was um, thinking exactly of that actually when I was talking about the shipping. Yeah. And and, and uh, another thing before we depart, the perhaps you know more obscure things. Another story in the book, George Locke, 21 years old from Brontis near Brecon, another grammar school boy, volunteer reserve. Uh, he, he did train overseas uh, under the Empire Air Training Scheme, trained mm. in uh, Alabama uh, and also in Canada, came back and was posted to the telecommunications f- uh, flying unit at RAF Deford near Worcester. Now, um, because... The Ger- well, because Johnny Frost had hopped over the water and, and pinched a radar off the Germans at Bruneval, you know, our, our telecommunications research establishment was down at Hearn at Bournemouth, which they decided was a little bit vulnerable. So that was all, all shunted inland to Malvern Boys College. Uh, and the, 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 the TFU provided the aircraft to do the experiments for all the radar. So everything like window, uh, moonshine, Rebecca, mandrill, all of those, ra- you know, countermeasures, they were all developed, an airborne interception radar, all developed at Malvern by TRE with aircraft from TFU. And George Locke, he's flying things like bow fighters, uh, uh, experimenting with the airborne interception radar. And they've also got Spitfires and Hurricanes there as a defensive measure. And also those fighters were acting as targets in inverted commas for the aircraft that are fitted with the airborne interception radar. And they oh. would do exercises between the Malvern Hills and the Breckens, which was called the Western Trials Airspace because it's it's away from enemy fighters and so on. And 26th of February 1943, poor George Locke takes off from Deptford, makes his left turn into the circuit, uh, out of the circuit rather, and flies straight into a Tiger Moth that's uh, doing aerobatics where it shouldn't have been, which was from the elementary flying training school at Worcester, uh, 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 the, the Tiger Moth just disintegrated around McPherson, the Australian pilot, who uh, bailed out. But poor old George went straight in at Kemsey and, and, and was killed. Um, uh, you know, uh, and, and the, the TFU, they, they suffered quite, uh, uh, extraordinary losses. You know, there was a Halifax crashed at Welsh Bickner with loads of boffins on board. I think there were about 15 altogether killed on that aircraft, something like that. Yeah. And there's a plaque in Goodrich Church by Goodrich Castle commemorating it. You know, and I, I don't think we, I don't think we realise how many uh, of these crashes there are. And it, in fact, my neighbour was round here in my office the other day and we were talking about this and, you know, I gave him a list of all the aircraft that had crashed in Gloucestershire. And he, he was absolutely amazed, you know. I mean, hundreds of the things, incredible. Yeah, it's, it's just something that doesn't really come up unless you're looking for it, I think. Yeah. It's easy as that when, when you get into aviation history to, sort of concentrate on bomber command or fighter command and this is what they're doing but very few people look at like the training and what the pilots went through and then like air crashes like we were saying such as this unit or even the training units it's actually, it's actually really quite interesting to scratch the surface of it depends how you go about it as well and, and you, you were going to ask me i think it's the next question on the list about flying officer frannick surma the pole yeah. uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about that because that that's that that re- that this really uh, encapsulates everything we're talking about. So, so back in 1985, which is about 400 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I'd say that I was born in 1980. That makes me really old. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Well, I was a bit older than you at the time. I, I was a young policeman and, and I was posted to, to work in Malvern and, and I met up with a friend of mine, Andy Long, and, uh, we, we'd done it, dabbled in a little bit of aviation archaeology before I joined the police and then I got sent away and, you know, we sort of lost touch and we bumped into each other. And he said, did you know that there was a, a Spitfire crash just outside Malvern, Polish Battle of Britain pilot, engine fire, bailed out in 1941, but he was missing in action six months later. And for me, it was like, ping, it was the light bulb moment that absolutely changed my life. And Andy and I put together what, the former Malvern Spitfire team to research the history of the aircraft and the pilot and uh, and and ultimately 
build a memorial to him because although he was missing, he wasn't killed at Malden, but but he was missing uh, uh, off the the French coast, eighth of November forty one mm-hmm. circus operation, which we're also going to talk about. Yeah. Um, uh, and excavate the aircraft at a big public event. I mean, it was a massive project uh, that, that we actually ultimately pulled off in eighty seven. But but the thing was, what what we did, you, you know, you start off with the aircraft's form seventy eight, which is its movement card. So that tells you, you know, which contract it was built under, which factory it was built under, when it was test flown, and all the different units it served with, and ultimately its fate struck off charge, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so when you've got that, you can then go to the National Archives as it is now uh, and cross-reference those dates with the operations records book to the squadrons concerned. And you can identify the, the flights that the aircraft made, uh, what those flights were, the context of them, what was happening and which pilots flew it. So with this particular airplane, R6644, well, what a fascinating thing. So this aircraft, it's a Mark one. Uh, built at Southampton at Supermarine, and um, didn't really see any action in the Battle of Britain. It, it went to um, five OTU at Aston Down, where it was flown on these various training flights. June, early July, nineteen forty, suffers a bit of a landing accident, so it goes away to be repaired at uh, Hamble. And then afterwards, it's with the uh, six one six squadron, which is being rebuilt to fighting condition up at Curtin in Lindsay, then yes, it's taken over by 65 Squadron, then it goes to 308, the Poles, uh, which is a recently formed Polish squadron during the Battle of Britain. We've got 302, which was the first, 303 that we hear so much about today. Mm-hmm. You know, and after the Battle of Britain, more and more of these foreign national units. Um, and, and this and Surma has flown throughout the Battle of Britain with various British squadrons because his English was quite good. Mm. And one of the one of the first poles to arrive, you know, the, these chaps, they were put into into RAF squadrons and embedded in them, you know, before the Polish, Czech and Belgian and Free French squadrons were were, were formed. So uh, Surma, you know, very experienced chap and ace, actually, also survived, shot down and bailing them out in the Battle of Britain. Uh, quite a story. But when you then look at it and the, the flights and the, the pilots who flew it, that's when it becomes interesting. So this was this was a it was an operational flight. But at the time, 303 Squadron, were, uh, 308 rather, they, they were at Baggington near Coventry and they were working up on Spitfires. They just converted from Hurricanes to Spitfires, pending going down to Northolt, number one Polish fighter wing for the nonstop offensive of 1941. You know where where the action was absolutely relentless. So it's in that period, and and Surma and another pilot took off to investigate an X raid, which is an unidentified radar plot over Worcestershire. You know he gets an engine fire and ends up sort of steering it away from the town and going over the side. But then when you look back at that, it was amazing. The people who'd flown it, absolutely mm-hmm. unbelievable. Billy Burton, who is although well, you can't see the things behind me, but forgotten heroes of the Battle of Britain. Billy Burton's on the cover. Cranwell Sword of Honour winner, uh, one of Bardo's squadron commanders down at Tangley, a far more talented individual than Douglas Bardo and would have gone, mm-hmm. would have would have ended up with air rank, you know, I mean, without without any question. Sadly, missing in 1943, a complete waste of life. That's another story. Uh, Buck Casson, Sir Hugh Dundas, uh, as Cocky Dundas became. Fantastic stories, these people. With 65 Squadron, Paddy Finnegan flew it, the great Irish ace. Peter Rose, who we were just talking about, who was the PRU pilot, you know, ultimately. Uh, and this is what makes it interesting. And, and then you look at some of the poles that flew it, or some of the people Surma flew with during the Battle of Britain, and some of the people he flew with afterwards. And, th- and you've got a massive story then. This was my first book, actually, a long time ago. Uh, you've got a massive story. And, and Gandhi Drabinsky, who was one of the Polish pilots in the Battle of Britain, and he knew Surma, and uh, jointly unveiled our memorial to Surma in 87. He wrote a foreword and Cocky Dundas wrote a foreword. And in Drabinsky's foreword, he said that the story of the Spitfire was like an invisible thread that connected mm. all of those things and all of those people. So, so there's, the point I make is where, where I live, I, I, I wasn't lucky enough to live in sort of Battle of Britain country, if you like, living in Worcestershire and Gloucestershire, but there's still direct Battle of Britain history around you because these aircraft that crashed during training, a lot of them had been in the Battle of Britain. 
Yes. But once you start delving back into the history of the aircraft, you uncover this incredible Pandora's box uh, of fantastic stories. Uh, it's just a, a, an amazing thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. I used to work at the Imperial War Museum, and obviously we've got the Spitfire there. And she'd been in 609 Squadron, which I quite liked. When I was at school, I bought Chris Goss's uh, Brothers in Arms yeah. about 609 Squadron. And again, again, it tells you all the pilots that flew it. And then she's got like a after 609 Squadron, she went off to do something else. And it's amazing, as you said, it's amazing sort of the thread of all the different people who flew her and what, what it actually got up to. Well, it is. Um, and in, in Spitfire Down, that chapter about the Penny Fan Spitfires, one of those was with 609 Squadron at the same time. Yeah, and at the same time as R six nine one five that you're talking about, that's hanging off the ceiling in at Lambeth, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, so there, there are all these little nuances and connections between all of these things. Absolutely fascinating. So again, we just sort of touched on them briefly, but we have in 1941, the Battle of Britain's over. The RAF starts to take the fight to the Germans in France. What were circuses and rhubarbs? So what happens is, uh, cutting a very long story short, because it's another podcast entirely about the big oh, leak, obviously, in the Battle of Britain, the big row about tactics and a disgraceful political element to it and a replacement of Air Chief Marshal Downing and Air Vice Marshal Park oh. by Air Marshal Douglas and Air Vice Marshal Lee Mallory. Don't start me off about all that. No, I agree with you on that one. <laughs> the travesty. Indeed. But suffice it to say that Douglas and Lee Mallory, who got it totally wrong, with, uh, got got what they would like, I suppose, us to remember as an offensive outlook. So, so they were all about taking the war across the channel to the Germans by day uh, in 1941 from the spring onwards. And, and it's very difficult to understand why, because um, there are no targets in, in northwest France that are strategically important, that are, are going to damage the German war effort. Um, and the, these operations are, are, are just unbelievable. So, so you've got rhubarbs, which are uh, low level, blown by a pair or a section of spit, say four spitfire, that, that nip over the channel at zero feet, pop up over the cliffs and, and shoot up targets of opportunity. And they were called rhubarb because they flew so low to get under the German radar screen, that they were down amongst the rhubarb. So they thought that if they called it rhubarb, the Germans would never figure out what on earth that was, <laughs> um, or the significance of it, you know. So, and then the, there's all sorts of other operations, ramrods, rodeos against shipping or specific yeah. targets by fighters. But the most complex are these circus operations. So the circus is, is, is you've got a small number, say half a dozen of two group blenheims, or a single Sterling, literally yeah. escorted by hundreds of Spitfire. So you'd have, uh, so so by now, fighter commands reorganised each sector station: Biggin Hill, Tangmere, Kenley, Hornchurch, etc. They've all they're all home to to a three squadron wing of Spitfires, and each wing has got a wing leader, which was a new appointment from March 1941 onwards. So. The wing leader's job was the best job in the Air Force, Johnny Johnson always said, because yeah. the wing leader could just concentrate on the flying and the fighting bit and leave the admin to somebody else, you know. So so you've got a close escort wing, you've got a, a top cover wing, you've got a rear cover wing, you, you know, you, you, you've you got a forward target support wing uh, sweeping ahead of the main formation and and then you've got a, a rear guard wing, you know, you've got a withdrawal cover wing. And this th this incredible thing, it, it's with these hundreds of airplanes, it's called called the beehive, because that's what it looked like. Uh, and I can only wonder at what it must have been like being a schoolboy stood on Beachy Head and looking up and seeing all of these airplanes milling around, just orbiting, all meeting up, you know, mm. and, until usually Bardu at that time, you know, said, let's go. And off they went to France, you know. Um, but the, the problem with it, well, there were so many problems, but the German fighter pilots were massively experienced in a way, you know, and this was it. During the Battle of Britain, for example, there was never a shortage of aircraft for the Royal Air Force and there was never a shortage of pilots. What there was, in fact, uh, if you look at the figures, which I was working on yesterday, um, that our number of operational pilots actually increased as the battle went on. 
whereas mm. the Germans decreased. Um, but they've not got combat experience, whereas the German fighter pilots, they're not rested like ours were. They're a fighter pilot until they're either incapacitated by wounds or killed. So yeah. these guys, very experienced. There, a lot of them have fought in, in Spain. They've also fought their way from Poland to the Channel Coast. You know, these are very, very experienced, very dangerous people flying a fantastic airplane. First of all, the 109E, and then, as we were discussing earlier on, the 109F with France, fantastic airplane. And yeah. later, the Focke 190, which was a whole different set of problems. Mm -hmm. Because these targets were not strategically important, they could pick entirely the time and place to attack so that all of the circumstances were tactically in their favour, everything, you know, and they would also fight to the advantage of the, the, the technical specification of their aeroplane. So I remember David Cock, Wing Commander David Cock, who was on 19 Squadron, I remember David saying, you know, that, that the 109s used to attack from just, a, you know, very, very high up. Most of the time, they, they refused combat until the, ta the, the tactical situation was in their favour. And then they would just dive down through the RAF formations at incredibly high speed Mm. Uh, because they, you know, the airplane was fuel injected, so they could achieve incredibly high speeds in the dive, and and it was a quick bam, 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 and gone. You know, none of this dogfighting rubbish. Yeah. Uh, and David, you know, they say, you know, we used to call it the dirty dart. Here they come, you know, dirty dart, in and out, hit hard, hit fast, get out, bang, 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 bang. So, so the Germans have really got all the aces, and it, it's a it's a different situation again. So we've got. Now, RAF pilots having to face two sea crossings on a single engine with an aircraft that's not designed to be an offensive fighter, just as the ME-109 wasn't when it was escorting bombers in the Battle of Britain, exactly the same scenario, you know, uh, although fortunately our Air Sea Rescue Service had, in, had improved a bit by 1941 because it was dying during the Battle of Britain, uh, barely existed. So... The, the the problem then is not only the air fighting, and we lost 1941, I think, by about three to one in the day fighter war. Uh, and Archie Winskill, 41 squadron, Sir Archie, as he became, Archie was shot down near Calais and bailed out in July 41. And he was held by Harry Cole, who was a, an SOE agent over there, uh, who asked him, why are there more Spitfires crashing in France than 109? And I remember Archie saying to me, you know, I, I had no answer for it because, of course, because of Ultra and the decrypts and, and all the rest of it, you know, fighter command headquarters and the war cabinet, they were fully aware of, of how, how grievous the losses were. But after the 22nd of June 1941, it became political because of the invasion of the Soviet Union. Yeah. So you've got Stalin, who is clamoring for a second front, and there's no way in a million years. Britain is in a position to open the second front. America's not even in the war yet, you know, and Britain's salvation at the end of the day lay in two things. It, how it, it lay, and Hitler knew this during the Battle of Britain, uh, and the invasion of Russia was part, actually, was part of his strategy to, do, to defeat Britain, that Britain was hopeful that the Russians would change sides after the non-aggression pact with Hitler, uh, and, or, and equally, that the Americans would then come into the war. So Hitler thought, well, if I can take Russia out very quickly, which these generals believe they could, yeah. you know, for a start, he's defeated Bolshevism, he's got his living space and all the resources that go with, with Russia. But equally, the defeat of Russia will preoccupy America in the Far East because this is going to massively, the defeat of the Russian Empire in the Far East is going to massively benefit the Japanese and cause the Americans problems. And that means the Americans, are they're not going to come into the war in support of Britain, because they're going to be tied down elsewhere. So there was a big strategy behind this invasion of Russia. So, Absolutely. you know, this is why they had to keep on with it. Uh, and the amount of pilots that we lost, look at the people of massive experience. Eric Locke, shot down by machine gun fire uh, on a, a, a pointless rhubarb uh, over Calais, shot up a few German troops. Now, when you, you look at the anatomy of a Spitfire, the, the underneath the nose, you know, you've got, you've got the oil tank. Yeah. And, and, and lots of other very important bits and pieces. Uh, and the, the, it's, this isn't protected by armor plate or anything. This is just protected by sheet aluminium. 
So it only takes one rifle calibre round to get a lucky hit in an oil mm-hmm. tank or in a cooling system, and that aircraft's only going one place, and that's down because the aircraft, the, the engine's either going to seize and or overheat or both. And that's what happened to Eric Locke, and he's gone down into the sea. Same with Bob Stamford Tuck, massively experienced wing leader, shot down, captured. Douglas Barder ends up uh, getting uh, shot down and captured. All of that is a whole di- whole nother, uh, about 10 podcasts probably. You know, uh, and, and these are experienced leaders that fighter command cannot afford to lose. And Johnny Johnson, who was my great mentor and friend, when Johnny... Uh, was rested from leading his first Canadian wing at Kenley in 43. And he went to 11 Group headquarters at Uxbridge as a staff officer. Johnny uh, put a stop to rhubarb, thank God. Uh, and, and they were just pointless. But, 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 the, but the problem was there was no other way of demonstrating to Stalin, the Western Allies, support of the Soviet Union. So the strategy became to pin down German units in the West and also get them reinforced by units that were otherwise going to be sent east. But that never happened because no. JG2 and JG26 defended the Channel Coast throughout the war without without being reinforced. So, you know, it's easy, isn't it? We're all armchair air marshals now. We can all look back and go, oh, yes, well, you know. But at the time, there's no precedent for any of this. And people are doing what they think is right, you know. So although we can say, well, it was wrong, and there were so many pilots killed, which there were unnecessarily. You know, these pictures are not necessarily quite so clear at the time, are they? Absolutely. It's the, uh, they say, uh, hindsight is always twenty twenty. But just to throw out a quote, because this is one of the ones that stuck in my head. Feld Marshal Kesselring said in the Battle of Britain that, roughly paraphrasing, that if an English pilot is shot down, if he has provision of that he's not wounded and that he has a new aircraft, he can be back in action tomorrow. Whereas any one of my pilots is a complete loss. Fast forward to 1941, and that's completely flipped. That yeah, if a exactly, yeah. Luftwaffe guy, if there's 109 waiting for him, he's back tomorrow. Area and all, like I said, all those, like the, if they survive the Battle of Britain, they've got loads of experience. It's all gone. Absolutely, yeah, dreadful. Can you tell me about the tragic loss of Sergeant Geoffrey Painting? Well, no, therein lies the tale because back in, I reckon it would have been about 93. Peter Howard Williams, DFC, had flown Spitz with 19 Squadron, Battle of Britain, and then he was a flight commander on 118 Squadron, down at Ibsen. Mm. And Peter was dying of cancer, and he wrote me reams and reams and reams of letters uh, recounting his experiences. And I wrote a chapter about him in a book called A Few of the Many in, in 95. I think he died by then. But he said to me, he, he took no, no, a fa- very famous film called The First of a Few, starring David Niven and, and Leslie yeah. Howard, um, and uh, which was filmed at Ibsley, telling the story of um, R.J. Mitchell. And Peter was a very keen photographer, so he'd taken these pictures during the making of the film, which he gave me. Uh, and in one of them, he's taxiing past the film set, waving, and he said, we were actually coming back for an operation on that day. Uh, and I'd actually lost my number two, Jeffrey Painting. Mm. And we were very upset about it because he was only 17. And I remember thinking, Dad, that can't be right. That can't be right. That, that, that's an old man who is approaching the end, who, who is yeah. not quite remembering things right, you know. So, so I, I didn't pursue it. But anyway, when I came to write Spitfire Down and, and the idea of this book, was to put, you know, a lot of these forgotten stories together, um, you know, and, and breathe life into them and give the dead a voice is the, yeah. the important thing, you know, at least have them documented in one place and, you know, pro- properly sort of accurately um, uh, described. So I thought, oh, I remember that about Geoffrey Payton. Of course, it's much easier today. So all you do is uh, Commonwealth War Games Commission website, which obviously the, the interweb, as they call it on the detectorist, didn't even exist back in, you know, in 93 or whatever. Um, Jeffrey Painting, 17 years old. Now, what Peter was wrong about was Jeffrey Painting was killed in September 41, and the first of the few wasn't made until April 42. Mm. So the photograph of Peter's where he's taxiing past the film set couldn't have been taken 
on the day that he lost yeah. Jeffrey Painting. But nevertheless, everything else Peter said was spot on. And what, what had happened was Jeffrey Painting was, I mean, this is where it got really freaky weird, because um, Michelle Bavistock, uh, my friend's wife, Michelle's a genealogist, so she never let me down. Say to Michelle, can you look at this person for me? Find this family for me. And, you know, very, very I don't think ever we, we've not found anybody. Anyway, so Michelle looks into it and turns out Geoffrey Painting was from Gravesend in Kent. Right. His awesome. father was a headmaster. Well, when we look further back into the family tree, it turns out that both his parents were from Worcester, which was my own town. Mm. And uh, where Geoffrey uh, Painting's father's family from, it was about two streets away from where I grew up. Oh, which wow. Was absolutely bonkers. And where his wife's family were from, on the other side of Worcester, you could have thrown a brick at that house from my first, you know, first or second house years ago. So it was just like a bit bit freaky weird. Anyway, um, cut the long story short, we find the family uh, and the, the, the whole story sort of comes out, you know, and he, he trained overseas. Uh, he hadn't been on 118 Squadron very long. I think this was his, his second sortie. And they went off. Um, 118 Squadron, Spitfires, only a flight of them, led by Peter. Uh, I think it might even have just been four of them. And they were escorting uh, hurry bombers who were yeah. going to attack these flagships off Cherbourg. And they and, and 501 Squadron Spitfires were providing top cover. So, you know, it was just one of those things. I mean, Peter was scathing about the attack by the hurry bombers. He said they were absolutely useless. And they attacked from completely the wrong direction. So instead of having the, the ship sort of side on, so you've got a big target, they attacked yeah. the back. So you've got like a long strip, down here, much more difficult to hit. And they didn't hit it at all. Um, but but then Jeffrey painting, you know, again, another lucky hit. And he goes down in the channel and he's missing. Mm. And he's 17 years old. And he was uh, and, and will always be the youngest pilot to die flying with the Royal Air Force. And yeah. uh, surprisingly, because these these casualties, you know, they they were hushed up, they weren't written about. Surprisingly, this was highly publicized at the time. And if you look at his casualty file at the National Archive, there's a, a newspaper clipping in there from I think it's the it's the mirror, I think, the Daily Mirror, a uh, baby of the RAF is killed. And it quotes his father, you know, saying we're very proud of Jeffrey and this, that and the other. You know, and that surprised me that that they would um, that they would publicise that. April the eighth, nineteen forty-two. We also have pilot officer James Lee. He's involved in quite a horrific accident as well, isn't he? Yeah. So this is this is another. You know, they're all sad, tragic stories, aren't they? Yeah. But I mean, Jim Bob Lee, who was from Comanche in Texas, he's an American, and you know, because of America's neutral, the Neutrality Act. Um, what they had to do was cross the border into Canada and join the Canadian Air Force and then come over here, which is actually why, uh, although some of them transferred to, to serve, you know, after America came into the war to serve in the Eagle squadrons, mm. there were a lot of Americans still serving in Canadian squadrons, such as yeah. Daddy Brown, Johnny Johnson's best pal, um, who was, who was an American, but he was serving in, Canadian squadrons in Johnny's wing, you know. So it, it, I don't think we're ever actually going to know how many American volunteers there actually were. You see, yeah. you can't track them easily. Anyway, Jim Bob Lee comes over and trains uh, uh, overseas, and then comes here, does his own, and he's doing his operational training down at Five OTU at, at Aston Down near Stroud. No, sorry, that's wrong. No, he was um, he was up at Harden. Harden up near Chester and on a cross country flight. So the weather is really bad. It's a horrible, not, not unlike today, actually, because it keeps going really dark in the office here. It was a squally, thundery day of heavy rain. Um, and also in the air is a Wellington bomber from uh, Harwell in Oxfordshire, another operational training unit. Now that area, Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire, you know, it's also proliferated with Wellington bomber training units. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, and, and, and Jim Bob Lee, the, the weather is horrendous. 
uh, and, and in, in a heavy rainstorm, he lands at Morton in the Marsh, uh, which which was another Wellington bomber operational training, actually. But the duty pilot sent him off again. He said, there's no problem. The weather's improving. Just just get straight straight back off. So he took off. Uh, and he, he must have become completely lost and disorientated because he ends up over Borton on the water, which is in, it, it, it's not far from Morton in the Marsh, only in a Spitfire, but it'd be about two or three minutes, I would think. But um, it's in completely the wrong direction. He's supposed to be going northwest back to Harden. Uh, yeah. And then in bright, suddenly, this squally day, it's bright sun. And you know what it's like when you're driving, as I was recently. You've got the wet roads and it's reflecting the sun. And, and suddenly, bang, these two aircraft collide and they're all killed. So Jim Bob Lee's killed, who's 20, I think. Uh, and there were seven killed on the Wellington. Uh, and some of those were um, uh, trainee, you know, radio operators, air gunners. Others were experienced uh, air crew who'd flown operations over Germany. You know, interesting thing about that, though, is that the... The Spitfire had flown with 610 Squadron in the Battle of Britain from Biggin Hill, mm. and had seen, seen action. And the Wellington involved was the aircraft that uh, Jack Ward, the New Zealander, climbed out on the wing and extinguished the fire over Essen. And really? Yeah, with that aircraft. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's right. All in the book. It's all in the book. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was it. And I think that there were... Well, there, there were seven killed on the Wellington. We traced all the families and so on, and Jim mm. Bob Lee's uh, people out in uh, Texas. Uh, and I think that it's probably in Gloucestershire the largest single loss of life in an aviation accident, I would imagine. I'm not aware of any others. No. Uh, yeah, it's sad. It's sad, really. And we got... Um, uh, from Comanche Museum, they, they, they've been donated the family's sort of archive about Jim Bob. And um, there are a lot of his letters to his best mate, Rambo, Hatch Rambo, uh, you know, and they're just kids, really, on an adventure, you know, just so sad. So that was the that was the Jim Bob Lee's uh, story. Yeah, that's, that's quite an unfortunate thing. Like you said, so I remember my granddad saying when he, 1941, when he was old enough to volunteer, he he went straight down to the RAF and said, "I'd like to fly Spitfires." Oh, yeah. he, just, he just wanted to go off and have an adventure, but they pointed out he was six foot and he couldn't fly a Spitfire, so he joined the army instead. But uh, <laughs> but it was that kind of gung ho, you know, all all eighteen, twenty one year old lads sort of, oh yes, yeah, go off and have adventure, and it's just yeah. had to be cut down that short. We talked about uh, the Spitfire in sort of British and Northern European skies, yeah. but you go on to talk about in in the book that. Uh, other Spitfire pilots who were lost around the world. Yeah. And you mentioned Flight Lieutenant Sanders. Uh, what happened yeah. to him in the aircraft off Malta? Well, this was another uh, extraordinary thing that must be a couple of years ago, I suppose. Um, a chap called Mark Eason contacted me uh, and said my his mother had, had recently died. He was 102. Mm. He said, I've heard about you and what you do. And in her belongings that I'm sorting out, I found a pile of letters, that, uh, and she was apparently, um, before she met and married my dad after the war, during the war, she was engaged to two Spitfire pilots, and they were both killed, and I've got all their letters here that they've written to her. So would you like them? I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Please. Archive, yes, please. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so Mark came over, and it, what, what a sad story. I mean, I mean, Joan Welch was her name. She was... Uh, beautiful young woman living in uh, Market Drayton in Shropshire. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of training bases again up there, you see, uh, where she met these guys. And in fact, Lester Sanders was distantly related, very distantly related. He was a bank clerk. Uh, and he was the first sort of fiancé. And he'd, he'd flown in in the circuses, you know, the, the non-stop offensive, 1941 with Travel 2 Squadron, I think, I can't remember. And then, and then goes overseas, goes to Malta. So this is all inspirational stuff, isn't it? The George Cross Island and Malta and yeah. open charity, the gladiators, and then the hurricanes turn up and then the Spitfires arrive, you know. Operation Pedestal. Yeah, exactly. All that stuff, you know, it, it, it's wonderful. Uh, and on, and again, you know, he did well over Malta, won a DFC, mm. but on the one particular day in July 1942, he shot down, uh, by 109 in Masafala Bay, which is off Gozo, 
yeah. and ditches this Spitfire and, and manages to swim ashore. Now, in 1973, um, that aircraft was actually recovered by divers. Um, and it's a bit, you know, the engine, it's not put back together, but, but there's substantial remains of the aircraft that are on show in the National Malta War Museum at Valletta. But, mm-hmm. And I remember seeing it when I was on holiday in Malta Donkeys years ago without realising that, you know, one day it would become an interest of mine. But then when Lester Sanders came home, he flew as a test pilot with Alex Henshaw at Castle Bromwich mm. until um, not long after he came back, actually, the Spit 9 he was testing just broke up in midair over Cannock Chase. And if you read Alex Henshaw's memoir, Cypher and Merlin, he, he, he was quite disturbed by this and, and said, you know, that there wasn't really a lot left of Leicester that was recognisable mm. sort of thing, you know. Uh, mm. and, and in um, uh, Joan Welch's diary that we've got, there's just this this note, you know, Lester killed, and there's the telegrams informing her that, oh, that he'd been killed. Uh, and then she was friendly with Rudy Bergwall, who was a Dutch uh, diver V1 ace. All right. Um, he was killed in August 44, uh, and he's buried in France, and that was another sort of um, big operation that was happening. Uh, and then she became engaged to Ian Smith. Uh, and, and Ian Smith's father, in fact, had been a flight lieutenant in the Air Force. Uh, and he was then killed, and he wrote reams of letters home. Uh, he he was killed uh, converting to Spitfires in Palestine. So again, there's the telegrams about all that as well. So that, that, that was, you know, a, a very moving chapter in the book that the Daily Mail picks up on. And it, it, was, it was in the mail... And it was all online everywhere, you know, uh, that, that it was just so sad that lightning struck twice. But ultimately, you know, and thankfully, Joan, who worked in the planning office of Shropshire County Council, met Philip Easton after the war and found happiness and, uh, you know, married. And Mark was a result of that. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, what, what a sad story, you know, just really shows the the uncertainty of life for young people in the service of their country, you know, and those who were left behind waiting for them to come home absolutely i mean it's just heartbreaking and that's what i really enjoyed about your book was the i try and do the same when i write is write about the individuals and their stories and how it fits into the the overall strategy because it's without these individuals and remembering who they were then we lose sight of it and there are so many sad stories you never know what's around the corner i i'm just i've just finished i'm doing this seven volume official history of the Battle of Britain for the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust and National Memorial to the Few. And it'll be about a million words altogether. Mm. I've just finished volume two, which was 140,000 words. And I'm having a bit of a break now before I start volume three by doing another book. And the book that I'm going to do, um, I haven't got a title for it yet, but Tony Osmond contacted me. His father was Alexander Osmond, who was a Hurricane pilot, 213 Squadron down at Exeter in the Battle of Britain. And um, he was sadly killed in 1943 in India fighting the Japanese. Mm. Um, and extraordinary, because in my archive, I, I, I've got thousands of letters. I'm looking at them all in the files on the shelves now. But I, the, I, I corresponded with Battle of Britain pilots from the age of well, about 18, I suppose. So yeah. I've got thousands of letters, you know, really thousands of them. But they are... Their letters to me, I didn't keep copies of my letters to them. So it's only half a story. Exactly the same uh, as Joan Welch. We've got the letters the pilots wrote to Joan, not the other way around. Well, with the Osmond story, we have got 420 letters, which are all of the letters, more or less, exchanged between them. So they were prolific correspondents. Uh, and it, it appears that when... that. Alexander kept all of her letters and vice versa. And then when he was killed, they were returned to her. So we've got the whole collection. The only gap in it is when she was living in Peckham and and the, the house was bombed during the Blitz. So mm. there's a section of the letters that are missing, but there's an interesting reason. Then she moved to Bristol and the house was bombed there. So there's a few more missing as well. Luftwaffe are clearly following her around a bit, you know. But, <laughs> and, and the photos that go with it, are it amazing? There, there are pictures of uh, of his training, elementary flying training at Gatwick, 
And mm. if anybody's familiar with Gatwick, there's the Beehive building, this sort of Art Deco building, lots of pictures of that in it. And then other pictures, which are just family stuff around and a page devoted to the 3rd of September 1939. And it just says war dot 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 or peace. And they're just young people, you know, lying around in the grass chatting and this sort of stuff, you know. Yeah. And I looked at this and I thought, this is amazing. You know, we've got to make a book of this because th this is unique in my experience to have that many letters and they are both signs of the story. And they're, they're very personal. They're love letters at the end of the day, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You never know what's around the corner. Even no. now, even now you don't. Even now. Absolutely. If you... If you look for it, if you look hard enough, treasure is out there to be found. And sometimes in the most surprising places, uh, you know, when, when I was doing Forgotten Heroes of the Battle of Britain, I went to see, I was very, I was put in touch with the family of Tom Gleave. Tom Gleave, famous Battle of Britain pilot, shot down, horrendously burned, wrote, mm -hmm. wrote his book, which was one of the first published actually in 1941, called I Had a Row with a German. Um, oh, yeah. He was a founder member of the Guinea Pig Club, you know, and after the war, he was um, a, 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 a deputy chairman of the Battle of Britain Fighter Association and a cabinet office historian, fellow of the Royal Historical Society, which resonated with me because I've been a fellow since 2006, I think. Um, you know, and I was put in touch with the family and I thought, well, this is probably a bit of a waste of time because... Somebody as well known as Tom Glee, who's been on This Is Your Life and all the rest of it, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to be anything for us here. Well, how wrong can you be? So when he yeah. died in 93, uh, his, his daughter and son-in-law moved into the house uh, and it's just a time capsule. There's bits all over the house. I mean, the hurricane was shot down in, um, you know, we go into, into the dining room. So, well, we've, we've got everything out for you to have a look at, you know, and, I don't know whether you'd be interested in this, but this is the unedited manuscript of the book, which we're about to publish, by the way, imminently. Sure. And uh, this is his 500-page uh, memoir that was unpublished. We're like, this is just bonkers. Wasn't expecting yeah. this. Wasn't expecting this at all, you know. So it isn't just... Uh, I, I remember Peter Fox, who was a 19-year-old hurricane pilot for Battle of Britain, and Peter always used to laugh and call himself and his mates the also rounds. He said, we, we were just there to make the numbers up, you know. Uh, and although I've written books about Bardic, because you can't really study the early war period without Bardic coming into it. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, Johnny Johnson and, and Peter Townsend, I knew, oh, what a lovely man Peter Townsend was. So you, you sort of do write about these famous people, but it was always the also rounds that really fascinated me. And I always thought that they were more likely to be um, the sources of stuff that's never been seen before because mm -hmm. they've got home, they they put the log books, the medals, the bits of mementos and the photos in a shoebox and stuck it in the attic and forgotten all about it while they're getting on with raising families and new careers and that sort of thing, you know. Um uh, and and that's just amazes me that it's just not always the case, you know. So yeah. it's right there. Uh, and and we we we're, we're on a big drive at the moment with Battle of Britain, the people's project, to get people to connect with us uh, and and make it a bit easier really instead of having to trace people come to us and tell us your story show us what you've got whether it's diaries letters photographs you know whether it's it's auxiliary fire service ambulance service um balloon barrage anti-aircraft anything i'm interested in the 360 degree story you know all of this is massive what you said earlier uh, about these individual stories and putting them in the, you know into the strategy well that's exactly what it is because it's about, it's a pyramid. It's an inverted pyramid. At the top, you've got the strategy and the context, all of that content coming down to that point, which is that individual story. But you can't really understand that individual story entirely unless you've got all the rest of that inverted pyramid giving you that context. So there you go. We've probably done over an hour now. I've probably <laughs> bored you with this. Yes. this all day. <laughs> no, absolutely, me too. Um, as a plug for you, for your Battle of Britain project, if there's anyone listening who wants to get in touch, they've got a story or information, how they can do that? Battle of Britain project, on the website, there's there's a page that takes you to the project website, Battle of Britain, the People's Project. So if you just Google Battle of Britain, the People's Project, uh, you know, it'll take you to it. And then there's a contact form or 
go through my website just send me a, a message or i'm a big facebooker i'm always on facebook so um and it, instagram not so much i came off twitter it drove me insane <laughs> yeah it does all of us yeah yeah no i, I haven't got time for that flipping nonsense but yeah. um but yeah so i'm easy to find and and you know we're always happy to talk to anybody and I bore anybody about the Battle of Britain and Spitfires. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I could be here all day. But uh, <laughs> and thanks very much. And we'll um, we'll try and stock uh, Spitfire down in the History Hack online bookshop as well. Every with every sale, we get a small slice, and you get yeah. a large slice than you would if it went through Amazon. So thanks very much, and we'll, we'll have to talk again about something. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, well, there's plenty to talk about. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.